Do you ever hear strange noises in the night? Have you ever seen something move in a mass of trees out of the corner of your eye? Or have you ever seen lights in the sky that you can't explain? Have you ever thought it was a ghost, or a cryptid, or something otherworldly? Sure, there may be logical explanations, but sometimes things happen that we simply can't explain. We'll examine these stories on our brand new channel, Paranormally Listed. If you love stories about hauntings, mysterious creatures, UFOs, and other unexplained phenomenon, we'd love it if you subscribed. Paranormally Listed goes live on Halloween night at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You can find a link to the new channel in the description box below. But before we start today's video, we want to bring you a word from our sponsor, Raid Shadow Legends. I've got a secret for you, and trust me, you'll want to know about this secret because it's a hidden gem that is completely free. It is something that will make your life so much more interesting. It's the greatest mobile game of all time, Raid Shadow Legends. One of the most amazing part of Raid is its outstanding lineup of characters. They have over 600 heroes, and each of them have their own factions with a lot of lore. Today I want to talk about one of my favorite factions, the Dwarves. They are the third race that came into existence at the time of creation. They have always kept to themselves, and usually only interacted with other kingdoms through trade emissaries and other go-between agents. They have a rigid caste system with Delvers at the bottom and the priesthood at the top. Not long ago, the Dwarvian Kingdom was nearly invaded by the Sarath's demonic forces. In the end, the Dwarves won, but at a large cost. The Dwarf King was forced to take his army to the surface and join the forces of light against darkness. For the first time in a thousand years, the Dwarves now have an alignment. The Dwarf characters look amazing. Just check out this character, Samar Jemkurs, and Tormund the Cold also looks incredible. There is so much going on in Raid this month. Every day they have a special event and they have some awesome new champions. The big update this month is called the Guardian Ring. It's a massive feature that gives you a ton of new ways to use your champions. This includes the whole new Faction Guardian system, which is a new way to get legendary champions you missed out on and it's a brand new way for you to upgrade your favorite champions. It's something that myself and the Raid community are super excited for. With all these updates, it's never been a better time to get into Raid. Raid already had so much going on. They have a great game mode called Dungeon Bosses, where you take on gigantic bosses for awesome prizes. I also love the PvP arena, because I find it fun annihilating other players. If you want to get a huge head start in Raid, all you have to do is hit the link in the description, or scan my QR code, You'll get an epic hero, Shanru, who is amazing in the Doom Tower, 200,000 silver, 1 experience boost, 1 energy refill, and 1 ancient shard, so you can summon an awesome champion as soon as you get in the game. All this treasure will be waiting for you here. Once you're in, you can find me in the game under the name C-Listed. If you're fast, you can join my clan. And it's that easy. Click on the link in the description, and I'll see you in the game. Number 3. The Kern County Jane Doe Arvin, California is a small city about 20 miles southeast of Bakersfield. In 2011, it was home to just under 20,000 people. The primary industry in the city is agriculture. It is home to many vineyards and orchards. On March 29, 2011, the police were called to a vineyard just outside the city. The detectives who were on scene later said that what they saw disturbed them. One detective admitted they had several nightmares afterward. Lying on a dirt road was the headless body of a woman. Her thumbs had also been removed. The body had also been drained of blood. Without the head, the medical examiner could not say for sure how the woman died. What they did know was that the killer took his time with the victim. For example, her body wasn't just pushed out of a moving vehicle or dropped haphazardly. Instead, the killer parked his vehicle, carried the body to the spot where it was found, and posed her in what appeared to be a sexual manner. Also, the cut that removed her head was clean and tidy. The investigators believe that the head and thumbs were removed to hide the woman's identity. Her fingerprints were entered into missing persons and criminal databases, but no match was found. One theory is that her thumbs were removed because sometimes thumbprints are in databases 
for driver's license and passports. One thing that the police did not understand was why did the killer drain her blood? They thought it was possible that the blood was drained because the killer may have thought that the investigators wouldn't be able to get any DNA from the victim, but they were able to get DNA from the body. However, no match to the DNA was found. What is known about the woman is that she was probably between the ages of 45 and 55. She was between 5 foot and 5 foot 6. She was either white or Hispanic. There were no signs that she used drugs and she didn't have any tattoos. She did have a couple of scars that may be clues to her identity. They were surgical scars. She had one from a mastectomy and one from a cesarean section. This strongly suggests that she had breast cancer and she gave birth. But that is all the police know about her. They have no idea what her eye or hair color is because her head has never been found. They've also never been able to do a facial reconstruction. In October 2020, experts with a nonprofit organization specializing in finding DNA matches said that they would take on the case. However, if they made progress on the case, that has not been made public. The police believe that identifying the woman will help lead to her killer. Or at the very least, it will open up new venues for them to investigate, and hopefully, one of those avenues will lead to her killer. Number 2. Virginia Jilson On October 3, 1997, a jogger was running near the Christina Mall in Newark, Delaware. In a clump of trees, they found the dead body of a woman. The body was fully clothed. It turned out that she had been slashed several times. Some of those slashes were made after death. She was nearly drained of all her blood. She had also been tortured and mutilated. One investigator said that her killer was definitely a sadist. Her clothes were bloody so it's believed that she was dressed after she was killed and her blood was drained. There were no signs of sexual assault. Since no blood was found in the clump of trees, the police believe that she was killed elsewhere and then dumped in the trees. The medical examiner couldn't determine when she was killed, but they did not think that the body had been in the clump of trees for very long. The police identified the victim as 37-year-old Virginia Jilson. For several years, Jilson had lived a rough life. It all started seven years earlier when her husband was killed in a workplace accident in Texas. Shortly afterward, she was arrested for forgery and she did a brief stint in jail. In 1991, the year after she lost her husband, Jillson moved to Delaware where she grew up. In 1995, her life seemed to be on the men when she gave birth to a son. The father was a man who lived in Newcastle, Delaware. Jilson and the father never married. It was Jilson's second son. Her firstborn son lived with his father. For four years, Jilson lived in a rundown apartment building in Glasgow, Delaware. Her young son would occasionally stay with her for a few days, but he generally lived with his father. Jilson had never been arrested for prostitution, but her neighbors suspected that she did sex work. In September 1997, a few weeks before she was found murdered, she was evicted from her apartment. After she was evicted, she lived in motel rooms. She told several people she planned on moving away. Since Jilson didn't have a stable residence, the police were unsure when the last time she was seen alive. Initially, the police thought that Jilson's murder might be connected to two other unsolved murders. Three years earlier, on November 11, 1994, the body of 37-year-old Bonilla Jones was found at a residential construction site in Newcastle. She had been beaten to death. When she was found, she was fully clothed. 
Nearly two years before that, on January 5, 1993, 35-year-old Linda Moody was found stabbed to death in a vacant parking lot in Wilmington, Delaware. She was nude, but her clothes were found near her body. The police thought that the murders might be connected because all three women were doing sex work and they were all in their mid-thirties. But the police could find no other connections, nor did they come up with any suspects. Several months after Virginia Gilson's murder, a suspect did pop up on the radar. On April 20th, 1998, 49-year-old Deborah Puglisi was gardening outside of her home in Newark. 40-year-old auto worker Donald Flagg drove by her home and he decided he wanted her. Flagg pulled over and he let himself into her home through an unlocked door. He sat at the kitchen table and helped himself to a few beers. Deborah's husband, 50-year-old Anthony Polizzi, was a funeral director. When Flagg broke into their home, he was at work. But then he came home for a nap. When he walked into the house, Flagg shot him point-blank range in the head. The 50-year-old man died nearly immediately. Deborah did not hear the gunshot because there was construction work happening near her house and a neighbor was mowing his lawn. When Deborah came in and started washing her hands, Flagg grabbed her from behind. He punched her in the head. He then dragged her into the basement where he tied her up and raped her. He then carried her out to his car and put her into his trunk. Then he drove to his house. For several days, Flake held the 49-year-old captive. She was tortured and raped multiple times. When Flag would go to work, he would leave her tied up in the house. On the fifth day of her captivity, Deborah managed to free herself and she called 911. Officers rushed to free her, and other officers swarmed Flagg at work. Donald Flagg went to trial a year later in April 1999. After a three-week trial, the jury deliberated for four and a half hours. He was found guilty on all charges. Flagg was looking at the death penalty, but the jury voted that his life should be spared. The judge ended up sentencing him to eight consecutive life sentences with a special contingency. Every April, he would have to spend five days in solitary confinement. The judge wanted this to be a reminder of what he did to Deborah Polisi. After Flagg was arrested, the police investigated to see if they could connect him to Virginia Gilson's murder. Clearly, Flagg was a sadist. It also turned out that he knew Jilson. The police searched his home and they found some blood. They compared the DNA to Jilson's DNA, but it wasn't a match. When the police couldn't find any evidence to connect Flagg to Jilson's murder, they eliminated him as a suspect. At the time of this video, 63-year-old Donald Flagg is serving a sentence at the James T. Vaughn Correctional Center in Newcastle County, Delaware. The murder of Virginia Gilson is considered cold. Investigators say it is one of the most gruesome and disturbing unsolved murders in Delaware. Number 1. Adam On September 21, 2001, a man was walking across Tower Bridge in London, England when he noticed something odd floating in the Thames River. He initially thought it was part of a mannequin, but then he realized it was a small torso, so he called the police. Police officers managed to fish the torso out of the water near the Globe Theater. It turned out to be the torso of a young boy. He was black and he was about four to eight years old. The medical examiner thought that the torso had been in the water for about ten days. The medical examiner believed that the boy bled to death after his throat was slit. His arms, legs, and head were expertly removed. On the body was a pair of girls' orange shorts. 
in his stomach was some cough medicine along with a strange substance that appeared to be vegetation. The police had no idea who the boy was or where he came from. Not having any limbs or head made it incredibly difficult to identify him. The police followed up on one of the few clues they had, which was the orange shorts. They had a label on it that said Kids and Company. It turned out that the orange shorts in that size were only sold in Hamburg, Germany. But after that lead, the case went cold. Over the next year, testing was done on the body, and it was revealed that shortly before his death, the boy lived in Africa. He probably came to England a few days or several weeks before he was murdered. Some experts weighed in, and they believed that the murder was ritualistic. But they couldn't agree why he was murdered. One group of experts believe that he was killed as part of a medical practice performed in southern Africa called Muti. Witch doctors remove victims' limbs on behalf of their clients to do things like secure good luck or ensure a business deal will go through. Another group of experts thought it was a Yoruban ritual. Yoruban is a belief system in Nigeria. They think that the killing may have been a sacrifice to the goddess Oshun, who is usually associated with water and fertility. In 2002, the police thought they got a promising lead. In Glasgow, Scotland, a social worker was investigating a woman named Joyce O'Shady and her two daughters. In their home, the social worker found objects often used in rituals. There was a court hearing to put the children into foster care. At the trial, Joyce testified and she talked about cults, human sacrifices, and ritualistic killings. After the trial, a police officer in Glasgow contacted the investigators on Adam's case. The investigators ended up searching the family's home. They found some clothes with the label, Kids and Company. They also found shorts that were the same size that were found on Adam's body. Joyce was questioned about Adam and she claimed she knew nothing about him. More testing was done on Adam's bones and his DNA. In December 2002, it was announced that Adam probably came from Benin City or the surrounding area. Benin City is in southern Nigeria. It is also the hometown of Joyce O'Shady. In November 2002, Joyce was deported. She was flown back on a chartered flight to Nigeria. After arriving in Nigeria, she vanished. After she was deported, the authorities in Germany said that in late 2001, Joyce had been living in Hamburg, Germany. This is the same city where it's believed that the shorts Adam was wearing were purchased. When Joyce was under investigation, the police looked through her phone and she only had two contacts. One contact was called Musa Kamara. The police investigated Kamara and they learned that his real name was Kingsley Oho. In Oho's apartment, they found some unusual things, like an animal skull with a nail embedded in it, jars full of strange liquid, and small packets packed with dirt. He also had videotape labeled Rituals. It turned out to be a dramatic movie about an adult who was decapitated. The police found nothing to connect Oho to Adam, but they did learn that he was a major player in a gang that was heavily involved in human trafficking. They began to follow Oho, and they learned about his gang's criminal activity. In July 2003, he and 21 other men and women were arrested. The strange substance that appeared to be vegetation that was found in Adam's stomach had been sent to a botanist. In October 2003, the botanist's report revealed that it was actually two plants. The first was a caliber bean which is also called a doomsday or ordeal plan. It's commonly used in witchcraft ceremonies in Western Africa. It causes paralysis in someone if they ingest it, but they can still feel pain. 
The second vegetation was ground up seeds from a detour plant. It works like a sedative and it causes hallucinations. The detectives think that Adam was fed this before he was killed. When he was being murdered, he would have been aware of what was going on, but he wouldn't have been able to do anything to stop it. In July 2004, Kingsley Oho was convicted for his role in the human trafficking ring and he was sentenced to four years in prison. It was recommended that after serving his sentence, he should be deported. It turned out that while Oho was in prison, he would perform rituals for other inmates for money. In 2005, Oho reached out to the police from his jail cell. He claimed he wanted to help find Adam's killer and clear his name. But none of the information he gave the police helped in their investigation. In 2008, Kingsley Oho was sent back to Nigeria. The same year, Joyce reappeared and talked to the police. She said that for a while, while she was living in Hamburg, she looked after the boy, who they called Adam. She was also the one who bought him the shorts. She said that she passed the boy off to a man named Bawa. After the interview, Joyce vanished again. Late in 2008, the BBC tracked down the social worker who first investigated Joyce. She recalled seeing a young boy with Joyce for a while. She now believes that this boy was probably Adam. In 2011, a friend who kept Joyce's belongings after she was deported looked through her belongings and found a picture of a boy who was around the age of Adam. Joyce was located once again and she was asked if the boy in the photograph was Adam. She said his real name was Zikpamoza. But then, a year later, Joyce's brother, Victor, contacted the BBC. He said that the boy in the photograph was not the boy known as Adam, and his name was not Ikpamwosa. He also said that Joyce wanted to set the record straight. So a reporter and a retired detective who was working on the case traveled to Benin City. Joyce said that the boy in the photograph was her son's friend. She said his name was Danny. Joyce then said that Adam's real name was Patrick Urharbor. She maintained that she gave the boy to a man named Baba. The reporter and the detective showed her a photograph of a man and she immediately said that he was Baba. The man in the photo was Kingsley Oho. The reporter was able to verify that the boy in the photo was a boy named Danny who was alive and well. However, he was not able to confirm if Adam's real name was Patrick Urharbor. Since that interview with Joyce, no progress has been made on the case. Adam is still officially unidentified as is his killer or killers. The police believe Kingsley Oho was involved in the murder, or at the very least, he has knowledge about the murder or the boy's identity. Oho has maintained that he knows nothing about the boy and his murder. It's believed that Oho is currently living in Nigeria. Thank you so much for watching today's video.